Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. It's wonderful to be in God's church on this day. Um, especially after a few, a few months without the church, we get, to re we get to appreciate it much more, don't we? I want to thank each one of you for uh, praying for my family and my sister's family and my mom during this difficult time for us. Um, and I can tell you, I can assure you that God is answering your prayers because we feel the, the peace and the comfort that only God can give. So thank you so much. This morning, the presentation is going to be done by the early teen Sabbath school class. Uh, we have a wonderful group and I'm sure you're going to agree with me at the end. Um, because of the situation with COVID and all this, uh, most of the presentations will be done by a video. Uh, they pre-recorded it and they did a great job with that. And the topic is on Christmas. As we know, in a few days, uh, we're going to be celebrating Christmas. And what better topic to talk than, than the birth of Jesus, the birth of Savior. So this time we're going to start with a prayer. Dear God, thank you um, for Sabbath. Please help us to have a good time and to learn something new. Amen. Christmas is celebrated differently from family to family. A lot of people put up a tree with lights and ornaments. Others, like you have probably seen in your neighborhood, put up lights and outdoor decorations. Families from all over the country come together and share a meal. Christmas music is played throughout the malls, although most of them are closed right now. Long lines are being formed and gifts waiting to be bought. Presents are wrapped and unwrapped as they are being opened. But what we really should be thinking about is celebrating the birth of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Hi, happy Sabbath. My name is Megan, and today I will be talking about Old Testament prophecies. One prophecy about Jesus is that he would be born to a virgin in Bethlehem. In Isaiah 7:14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. In Micah 5, Two, it says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old and from ancient times. The Bible also prophesied that Jesus would be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Psalms 78, 2 to 4, it prophesied that Jesus would speak in parables. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things from old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power, and the wonders He has done. Also in the Bible, it says that Jesus will be called King in Zechariah 9.9 Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt. In Psalms 8.2 It prophesied that the little children would praise Jesus. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe. Another prophecy in the Bible about Jesus is that he would be portrayed and spat on. In Psalms 41, 9, it says, Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. In Isaiah 53, 7, it says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. 
He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears, in silence, so he did not open his mouth. The Bible prophesied that Jesus would be hated without any cause. He would also be mocked and ridiculed. Another prophecy about Jesus is that his feet and hands and side would be pierced. Psalms 22.16 says, Dogs surrounded me, a pack of villains encircled me. They pierced my hands and feet. Another prophecy is that Jesus' clothes would be gambled for and would, he would be given vinegar to drink while on the cross. Psalm 63.21 says, They put gale in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Psalm 22.18 says, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Hosea 6.2 foretells about the resurrection of Jesus. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed learning about Old Testament prophecies. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born of the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Galatians 4, 4, 5. Happy Sabbath, Church. Today I'm going to be talking about the birth of Jesus. The topics I'm going to cover include the what, when, and where of Jesus' birth, the prophecies of Jesus' birth fulfilled, and how was Jesus found. Let's start with the what of Jesus' birth. Jesus' parents were Mary and Joseph. Jesus was born humbly. The Magi came to see Jesus and the prof many prophecies were fulfilled when Jesus was born. So let's stop and talk about the prophecies that Jesus' birth fulfilled. In Micah 5.2, it predicts that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. In Daniel 9.25, it predicted the time of his birth. In Isaiah 7.14, it predicted that Jesus would be born of the Virgin Mary. And in Luke 1.32 and 33, it predicted that Jesus would be born of the family line of David. Now let's talk about the when of Jesus' birth. During the reign of King Herod, Jesus was born. We believe that Jesus was born sometime around the fall of BC 4, although today we celebrate Jesus' birth on December 25th as Christmas. Herod had heard of a new king to be born, and he asked the wise men to tell him where Jesus was. So when the wise men got to Jesus, the angel told them to turn back a different way. Because Herod didn't find Jesus, he had all the baby boys, to and under, killed. Mary and Joseph then took Jesus to Egypt. Now let's talk about the where of Jesus' birth. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in a stable, and the shepherds visited Jesus. Jesus was born very humbly. So how was Jesus found? The wise men followed the star given by God. The wise men went to Herod, and Herod told them to come back to him and tell him where Jesus was. The wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And by the time the wise men saw Jesus, he was probably no longer a newborn baby. Let's talk about Jesus' dedication. Jesus was dedicated at the temple, as was the custom. His family, because they were poor, brought two doves instead of a lamb. During Jesus' dedication, he met Anna and Simeon, a prophetess and a prophet, who predicted that they would have seen Jesus. This presentation was prepared by Michael Harris. I don't see him here, so I will present it. When was Christmas first celebrated? According to early accounts from bishops in Judea, Christmas was first celebrated in AD 336, so that's almost four centuries after the birth of Jesus, uh, on December 25. 
It is the first recorded celebration of Christmas. Many of the pagan customs became associated with Christmas. Christian soldiers replaced the hidden tales, but the practices, sorry, Christian stories replaced the pagan tales, but the practices hung on. Candles continued to be lit. In modern time, they're replaced by lights. But over the years, gift exchanges became connected with the name of Saint Nicholas, a real but legendary figure, a charitable man. He threw gifts into homes. Christmas. Christmas was first celebrated in the U.S. in the mid-17th century by Puritans in the northern states of New England and Pennsylvania who celebrated the birth of Christ. Santa Claus in the USA is the equivalent of St. Nicholas in some European countries, the saint who gave presents to poor children during the winter. Christmas is and has been a worldwide holiday where we celebrate the birth of Jesus. And while I'm on topic of Christmas, you, as you will listen a little bit later on in the presentation, the Christmas is another holiday that has been Christianized, but its roots, roots were pagan. So I think we have to recognize that and in our celebration, make sure that we bring Jesus first. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold the tradition of men. Mark 7, verse 7 through 8. So this is Christmas Traditions by Jacob. So Christmas Traditions and what it means. So on com, it says how Christmas is a Christian festival celebrating the birth of Jesus or Christ. Also, the English term of Christmas means Mass on Christ's Day. So this means the birth of Christ or the day of Christ is the most recent origin next to earlier term, Yol, which I researched. And it means a German Advent calendar or an angular Saxon Yol, which referred to the festival of the winter solstice. Next, the origin of Christmas traditions even today on Briatdakana.com. It also says how the celebration of Christmas started in Rome about 336, but it did not become a major Christian festival until the 9th century. Many Christian Christmas traditions, such as decorating trees, started in Germany and later spread to other parts of the world, notably England and the United States. Also today, people like to put up Christmas trees, watch movies like Elf or The Grinch, or a Charlie Brown th Christmas, and put up stockings, make gingerbread houses, cookies, set up Christmas lights, and activity scenes from the Bible. Also, the origin of Christmas traditions around the world today. On this one website, Mamado, there's an article about 11 weird and wonderful Christmas traditions around the world, but I'm only going to tell a couple. Number one, Giant Lantern Festival in the Philippines. Number two, Gua Goat in Sweden. Number three, Kentucky Fried Chicken Christmas Dinner in Japan. St. Nicholas Day in Germany. Lighting of National Hanukkah Memorial, Washington, D.C. Number six, Day of the Little Candles, Columbia. And number seven, Kalakada, The Lights of Toronto. And here are some of the photos that I just read off. Finally, I hope you guys enjoyed my presentation on Christmas traditions and their origins. The end. Acts 17.28 for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of you, your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. Hello, church. So today I'm going to talk about Christmas poems. The poem I'm going to read about is Christmas Gift Suggestions. And it goes like this. To your enemy, 
forgiveness. To an opponent, tolerance. To a friend, your heart. To a customer, service. To all, charity. To every child, a good example. To yourself, respect. So what does this all mean exactly? Well, the first sentence means do to others as you would like done to yourself. So forgive the people that have hurt you, because I'm sure God forgives us. I am sure we have hurt him as well. The second sentence means when Satan tries to tempt you, you need to be tolerant, which means never give in and stay close to God. The third sentence means be kind and true to your friends because God is your friend and you need to give him your heart to God or else you will never make it to heaven. The fourth sentence means always give God your service because just like people at a store, they want to know where the food is and God wants to know where your heart is so he can change it. The fifth sentence means give back to others just like how God gave back to us, and how he gave us a second chance. The sixth sentence means, be a good example to others, and show them the right way, because I'm sure you have told your children or grandchildren, be a good example. And the last sentence means, give respect to yourself and God. So to sum up this poem, do all things in the name of God, and do it with a smile on your face. Goodbye. Hi, my name is Mark Waite, and the question for me was, how is Christmas portrayed in the music industry today? Christmas is portrayed in the mu music industry in many ways. The main theme that musicians sing about are mostly the fruits of the spirit. Some of them are peace, joy, love, goodness, gentleness. The only traits that are left out and all of the other songs are self-control and patience. According to the musical industry, Christmas is the best time of the year and everyone can't wait to open their presents on Christmas Day. But there are other songs that talk about having their family together and being with their loved ones for Christmas. And just being happy in general. Christmas is a time to just lay back and enjoy the people you have around you. Most Christmas songs are similar in many ways or give the same idea, but they are a few but there are a few that just plain out say or demand that they just want Christmas to be Santa. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creatures rather than the creator, who blessed, who is blessed forever. Romans 1.25 From silly Santa cartoons to live action nativity scenes, watching Christmas movies have been a very popular thing to do during December ever since the first Christmas film was created in 1898. That first short film was about good old Saint Nick, and the rest is history. 
Now, Christmas movies come in all sorts of styles, themes, and genres. The most common topics are about Santa, Christmas magic, Christmas miracles, magically finding true love, the nativity, the importance of spending time with the family, and sharing with those less fortunate. You probably have a fair favorite Christmas movie memory or tradition. I know I do. Every Christmas Eve, we watch the nativity story while drinking Mexican hot chocolate and snacking on Christmas treats. I really love this tradition because it reminds me about the real reason we celebrate Christmas. It reminds me that God loves me so much that he gave his only son to be born and later to die for me, giving me and all of you the greatest gift anyone could give. As you go about your holiday season, I encourage you to choose films that bring you closer to Christ, choose movies that have an uplifting message, and remind you of the true reason for celebrating Christmas. The best movies reinforced our belief in Jesus, true miracles, and sacrificial love. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas, and remember that Christmas isn't really about being entertained or being spoiled with presents as many movies show, but about remembering how much God loves us. Amen to that. So how would you celebrate Christmas? How, how would I celebrate Christmas? Would our friends and neighbors know that we are different, that we celebrate as Christians, that we really focus on the birth of Jesus? It started as a pagan festival. It became Christian festival. And now more and more, it's getting to be a secular feast. Mostly, Christmas is associated with gifts, at least I've been teaching for a number of years now, and uh, every time when I ask my students what do they do for Christmas, number one thing, getting presents. A um, couple of years ago, I started asking them to choose the Christmas song to learn, and I did not realize that almost 90% of them have not even heard Christian music song for Christmas. So it is up to us, up to you and me, to bring Christ back to Christmas, and to present the gift that God gave. You know, when we choose gifts, we may choose another sweater, another train set, another hat or gloves or a pair of socks, maybe another toy. But God does not give another. He gave the only. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave the only begotten Son. So, when we think about presents and celebrating Christmas, let's offer the gift of the only. Let's show everyone that the meaning of Christmas is not what happened 2,000 years ago, but what is going to happen now in my heart, in your hearts. So when Jesus comes soon, which we all believe is going to happen, we can celebrate the second coming of Jesus, which will be much better than any Christmas celebration. And with that, we are going to end today. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath and a blessed Christmas season. At this time, we can go to our, our respective Sabbath school rooms. Um, there is a Sabbath school here, and I believe there is one in, the, in Pastor Robert's office, in the overflow room, in the mother's room, um, and also various classes for the different ages of uh, children. So let's bow our heads for prayer at the end. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Help us to embrace him and to love him. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
happy Sabbath and Merry Christmas. It's Christmas and it's very exciting. I really appreciate you, what the uh, young people did this morning. That was really, really great. And uh, I think that we do, unfortunately, need to be reminded about the true meaning of Christmas. Um, it does appear to me that the gifts are such a big deal, you know, and um, it's overwhelming. So I really, really appreciate what the young people uh, did this morning. So there is, a, I don't know what class, I think it's the young adults maybe, uh, uh, want to pass out um, Christmas cards, have our class members fill out cards for a bunch of people, I don't know, they're um, just random. So what they want is for people to write down um, either a text or a, a Christmas thought in these cards, and there are quite a few it looks like. I don't know how that's gonna happen. I don't know what the mechanism is going to be uh, to get these cards filled out. But they want me to pass them out. So I think what we can do is, um, just <laughs> thank you, Rob. Just every, if everyone can just, just fill a card out, just, you know, just a few, few texts, because somebody wants to pass these out. Um, just a text and, and just sign your name from our Sabbath school class or whatever. I think that's what they're, what they're looking for. And at the end, um, what we can do, we can probably bring them back up here and I'll put them out in the, in the lobby there and they can, they'll uh, take it from there. I believe that's the idea. So it is Christmas, time for sharing um, and time for uh, letting others, even those that we don't know, know that we appreciate them. Uh, again, I want to, uh, Welcome everybody to Centerville. And also again, express my gratitude for you um, who know how to wear a mask properly or Sabbath school class does. I'm grateful for that. Over your nose and mouth, that's the way it is to be worn. And there's good scientific reason for it uh, related to the uh, virus being really a lot in the nostrils. So I appreciate that. I also want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online. And I long for the day when we are able to safely gather again together. Uh, at this time, it's obviously not possible, so I'm really grateful for those who are able to, to watch online and participate that way. All right, so um, Thanksgivings, uh, request for prayer. People that need to be prayed for, things, situations that need to be prayed for. Anybody have anything they'd like to share this morning? Yeah. confess that I didn't hear all of that, but you want to pray for yourself too, you said. Okay, and your name is? Christy? Christy, okay. Okay, the, when you fill out the cards, it should say from Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. All right. But so Christy is requesting prayer for herself. All right. Anybody else? Yes, John. Well, I just wanted to say that I'm very thankful that now at least the six health care providers are starting to get the vaccine. Yes. Uh, in our area and others, my daughter Karen in California just got hers yesterday. Oh. So she survived. <laughs> Says he feels normal now. I'm sure he's not, but uh, his uh, oxygen's going back up. And okay, he's wow. Still well. Okay, that's uh, another key to highlight for all Christy then. So there's a lot of thanks there, and uh, I, I would also recommend people taking vitamin D and uh, zinc because uh, vitamin D, in particular, has shown a, like a three times better uh, survival rate. Sorry about that, that was a little prolonged. And I just, I just want to reiterate what 
don't have to share that because... Um, First of all, uh, let me just address one issue, and it's probably the elephant in the room, which is vaccination. Um, it's very interesting that many people are really concerned about the vaccination. Uh, I, I, I want to respect those who have concerns about vaccinations in general, but I do want to say that, um, that I believe that this vaccination uh, will really help protect society. Of interest, and I don't have a great, I don't have a, a specific um, thing from Ellen White herself, but her secretary, Mr. Robinson, was it D.E. Robinson, whatever his name was, documented that during the smallpox um, outbreak, Ellen White got the smallpox vaccination because she wanted to protect society and participate in the preventive care. Um, as a physician myself, I do want to say that, that um, medicine has changed from way back when, and uh, along with medicine, we use preventive measures. So first of all, so far as medicine is concerned, I want to urge everybody, I'm going to get the vaccination. I can't wait to get it. Um, and um, I don't know where my name is going to be on the list, but I hope it's first. No, anyway, <laughs> but I hope it's right up there because um, this is really a serious situation. I do believe the vaccine is safe. So far as some people are concerned about various issues like the DNA, the vaccination, the, the nature of the vaccine, the way it's been manufactured, it does not enter the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is. So it cannot change the DNA. Secondly, no one's trying to put some sort of a chip in our brain so we can kind of like mock of the beast, whatever thing it is. Thirdly, it appears to me, it appears to society that this vaccination was, was developed quickly. Actually, it wasn't that quick. As you remember, there was the uh, MERS, the Mediterranean um, virus as well, was very similar to SARS-CoV-2, and the first SARS. Ever since those vaccines happened, very similar to SARS-CoV-2, they began to look at a new platform for vaccines back then, and they were studying back then. In fact, the, the, the pharmaceutical company Moderna, this is their first product they've actually brought, brought to market, but they actually began working on this platform way back then. This is about 10 years ago. That's a really important thing because this is not a sudden rush to a vaccine that's dangerous. This has taken a wonderful uh, period of time as people have just, just been looking at the signs of it and so forth. That's the reason that the, the, um, the genome that for, for this particular virus was able to be discovered and, and actually transcribed by January 15 of this year. The virus just broke out and then within a few weeks we knew exactly how that virus was made up. Based on that, then Pfizer began to look at, at vaccine platforms. So this is not something that came randomly. This is something that's been very well researched. Secondly, I believe in preventive medicine. As John has brought up, vitamin D is something very important. I've been taking a lot of vitamin D myself. Um, and as a physician, you don't go taking vitamin D willy-nilly. Vitamin D is fat soluble. You can develop toxicity with too much vitamin D. But I believe in taking it for, sh uh, for a short period of time at significant doses. I take 5,000 units a day currently. I've been taking that since the pandemic broke out as preventive health. Typically, you don't need that much, but I think it's very uh, protective. God has given us several things, I think, that are natural that we can use. Addition, in addition to the natural remedies, he's also given um, people brilliant minds to figure out what else needs to be done in the realm of medicine. So I think that's really important. That's my little two cents. John, you got me. I wasn't going to say a word, but, uh, but I think it's significant. By the way, um, the Adventist, the Health Services Department and the Biblical Research Institute have a publication um, about vaccination and so forth in general, addressing some of the issues that Adventists are concerned about. So you can look that up if you still have concerns. So anyway, but um, I just pray that this Christmas season that um, things begin to take a turn for the better for all of us. Let's pray as we begin Sabbath school this morning. Father in heaven, what a joy to be here today. It's Christmas. And we celebrate, whether or not it's the right date, we celebrate Jesus Christ and his birth and the gospel and what it has meant to us personally. And we want to give you thanks for what you have done for us. Um, for that silent night in a terrible place, that Jesus Christ came and tabernacled with us. And ever since that time, he has been God with us. Thank you so much. Lord, we've heard from some this morning. We've heard from Christy, who has requested prayer. 
And so we ask that in a very special way that you be with, with the concerns that she has, that you will minister to her in a special way. We also want to remember Peter, who has um, had COVID and um, has been treated and is feeling better. We ask for a full recovery for him as well. As we turn our, our eyes now and our hearts to the Sabbath school lesson at hand, we need your Holy Spirit, so we ask you to bless each one of us with your presence, with your teaching, so that our lives will be transformed, that we will not be like the man in James that looks in the mirror and walks away unchanged. Thank you so much, Lord, for the Sabbath day. For Jesus' sake, amen. All right, don't forget to fill the cards out. We have a lot of returns. We don't have that many cards, it looks like, maybe being filled out, but if you want one, we can, we can get you one. Just one line, you know, something about the, the news, the good news of Christmas. All right, so I want everyone to be turning to the memory text. That's Mark chapter 2, just a second here. It's Mark chapter 2, verse 27, 28. Mark, I think it is. Chapter 2, yes, verse 27, 28, if you can turn there. First of all, I just want to highlight the, the, the title of the lesson as we're going to Mark. So the title of the lesson today is um, Sabbath, Experiencing and Living the Character of God. Sabbath, Experiencing and Living the Character of God. We're going to come back to the title in a second after we read the, the memory text, but it says, Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, the context is the Pharisees are concerned that the, that the disciples were plucking uh, the grain and rubbing it together and getting food on the Sabbath day. And uh, they challenged Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. All right. That's the memory text. And we have the title. Um, is the title something that you have thought of before? Has it been easy to, to connect with the title? Sabbath, experiencing and living the character of God. Does that, is that intuitive to anybody? Is anybody kind of, whoa, I hadn't thought about that before. Anybody want to comment on, on the title of the lesson? That's the whole purpose of education. Okay, the whole purpose of education experiencing and living the character of God. I really was, uh, in initially when I saw the title, I thought, well, that's an interesting take. But I got to consider it, I realized, you know, that's really insignificant, that's important. Okay, so far as the memory text, uh, as you have laid this memory text, what does this memory text tell us about the Sabbath that is significant? The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Lord is Lord of the Sabbath. Yes? I think it means that God made the Sabbath in the same way that he made rhinoceroses and giraffes and people. He made it. He created it. And because he created it, it is part of the creation system okay. that's in this world. If we recognize the animals, the birds, the people, we should also recognize the Sabbath as part of the Okay, all right. So recognizing the Sabbath is part of the creation. All right. Debbie. It's also other scriptures. It never talks about, um, it says it was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. We love to think it's all about us. Okay, all right. So it's other centered. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, the Lord made it in a, made the tree in a seven day week. So she said that the Sabbath, um, that, that we are, it's a seven-day cycle, and that we need that seven-day cycle, that one day, to recharge. And when you try five and ten days, and that has been tried, it doesn't seem to work. It seems to be, to be counterintuitive to our natures. All right. 
Yes, with two hands, with one hand. can't just do what we want to do. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you very much. Scott. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, yes, Adelaide. Jesus used the Sabbath time to give spiritual healing and physical healing. Okay. And to break with the tradition that portrayed God as enjoying seeing somebody suffering. Um, and when and the lesson addresses the several instances of healing where he puts an importance of those on people more than on things like the animals, uh, as the Pharisees used to. Okay, so spiritual healing. Um, this is interesting because if you look at that there, if you, um, when you look at the idea that the Sabbath was, was made for man, God didn't make the Sabbath and then make somebody who could, who could obey the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for the sake of man. If you look at that there, it says it's for the sake of man. And it's because man needs to put aside our desires, our preferences, our priorities, and pay attention, surrender our priorities to the will and character of God, number one. Number two, um, we need to recognize that the Sabbath day was meant for our spiritual and moral healing. That's what it's meant for. It's very interesting. People oftentimes say that it was meant to recharge our batteries. We're going to address that a little bit and see if that recharge batteries issue um, is what it's all about. There are several daily themes. Uh, one of it is time to be astonished, um, time for rediscovery, time for learning priorities, uh, time for finding balance, and time for community. Um, we're going to talk about those in a little bit dis different way today. And I want to preface it by saying that if you look at the Sabbath, in Scripture, it is really a key, it is a central issue. And if you look at Revelation, it ends up being the issue, really, also, as it relates to worship. So the first thing I want to look at then, I want us to all to go to Genesis chapter 2, and it's verses 1 to 3. And what we need to do today, what I'd like to do, is to look at all those themes that we talked about. Time to be astonished, um, time for rediscovery and, and learning priorities, those three things in particular. And let's look at verses 1, Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3, and see how they help us understand this a little better. So I'm just going to read Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, and then we'll discuss. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So as we read these, these verses, there are some significant truths that we can mine from these verses. Um, as we read through, what do you guys think about this? What does it, what does it teach you about the Sabbath? Yes, John. Well, I think that the, in the top of, uh, of the paragraph on uh, Sunday, uh, I, I think an important concept is this idea of relationships, that God wants us to have a relationship with him. This is a day that we can do that without other distractions. Okay. And I think as, as humans, 
our, one of our biggest problems is we don't know how to balance our lives. Yes. We'll do things that we want to do or we think is important, and then we forget other things. And a lot of that time, things uh, relationships kind of suffer. Yes. But here's one day you can get a, every week you get a reset. Yes. Yes. And say what's important: being with God and being with our family and friends. Yes. And uh, neighbors. Okay. We're going to come back to that, that thought because it's really important. And John's brought the idea of, of relationships. It's really important. The most important relationships are relationship with God. Let me ask you a question as we proceed. Um, is it significant to you that Genesis, the book of Genesis, precedes the book of Exodus? Yes. Now, this is really important. And uh, the reason this is so important is that if you look at the story as we have it here, God worked for six days, and it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work and he rested. When you look at what he's talking about here, the context is not the Jewish people or Israel at all. This is mankind, period. So in Genesis, we see that the seventh day Sabbath, and someone was kind of alluding to that, Bob was, the seventh day Sabbath is the capstone of creation. So when you look at, when you look at creation, any theology of creation has to include the Sabbath, or excuse me, any theology about the Sabbath has to begin in creation. So as we talk about the Sabbath, we have to place it within creation. And if we do that, we recognize that the Sabbath was not made for the Jewish people, it didn't come about at, on Mount Sinai. The Sabbath came, out, came about at creation. When he was done creating, he made the big centerpiece, the Sabbath. And for that reason, then, Sabbath is invested with meaning. I think it is rich, the meaning of the Sabbath. So first of all, I think one of the first things we see is that that capstone has to do with um, with with creation in Genesis, and it does not have to do with Israel. Um, all right. Now, there's something else interesting here, and I just, for that, I think we need to look. It, if you look at what happened there in the creation week, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, the Adventist Bible commentary and other commentators also pointed out that this activity, creation, that word in the Hebrew, is unique to God, to God's activity. No one else does that. And so as we look at that word right there, that, that God created the heavens and earth in the beginning, that activity is unparalleled by anything humans can do. Out of nothing, God made everything that is. Men have to have something to work with. And so right away, we see the address there that there are, there are significant issues related to our origins and everything else that is that's related right here in this, in this, uh, this issue of, of creation. So God's unique unparalleled action is, is mentioned right here at the very beginning. We see it's the capstone of creation. Um, and then... If you look, there are a couple of things here. If, you, if we look in, chap, in uh, chapter 2, verse 2, it says when he ended, that the seventh day he ended his work which he had made, he rested on the seventh day. Um, and then it says God blessed it and sanctified it. There are two things that he did. He completed his work. That was the first pair. But then it says that he blessed it and he sanctified it. What's another word for sanctified? Set apart, okay. To set, to set aside, okay. Some translations say hallowed it, which means that the name that God is hallowed, this is the first scriptural reference to anything that's hallowed in the whole of scripture, which is Sabbath, which means that, that, that the Sabbath, because God blessed it and sanctified it, that puts permanence on the Sabbath. When we engage our other Christian brothers and sisters in discussions about the Sabbath being done away with, right here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, it tells us that God put a stake in time and said this is permanent. 
it's not going anywhere. The Sabbath was for mankind, not for Israel. That's what it's, we read right here in Genesis chapter 2. Additionally, it is permanent. When he hallowed it, that designated it as permanent. I think that's really important. Uh, Joe, are you about to say something? <laughs> Isaiah 58 talks about yes. what you're saying. You may be going to that. But it says, those from among you shall build the old waste places. You yes. shall raise up the foundation yes. of many generations. The Sabbath year is called a foundation. Yes. And I believe that's one reason yes. why we're here today, the Seventh-day Adventist. Yes. Is that foundation has been yes. disrupted. Yes. And, and I think that, and uh, as I look at the clock, the clock is flying fast, but it needs to, fast to, to go. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes we get in these discussions with people, and um, if we begin right back here in Genesis and make our points from what is discussed here, I think we can then go throughout Exodus to Isaiah and other passages and recognize that they have their origins right here in Genesis. This is permanent. This was never changed. It can't be done away with God himself. He blessed, he sanctified, and he said that this is forever. All right. So I think that's really important. Um, next, it says that God rested. Why would God rest after he created And I think John began to allude to this a lot. Yes, go ahead. As an example, oh, an example for us, okay. All right. As an example. Okay. When God rested from his work, there are several things that are identified here that are really important. First of all, one thing we recognize is that God made Adam and Eve, and he decided to rest with Adam and Eve to enter into a relationship with them. We have a relational God. He wants to enter into a relationship with us. One of the very important things about the Sabbath, first of all, you know, when we speak about this word bara, God spoke and he created, we look at God's power. But then we look at God resting and recognize that in resting, there are significant attributes of his character which are important. And those significant attributes are that God desires intimacy with his people. When he makes us, he doesn't just disappear. He wants to enter into an intimate relationship with us as he made the Sabbath. God is a relational God, and that's really important. He's a relational God. Secondly, as we look at that, we recognize that God is love. love God is love is not just a kind of a late disclosure in the Gospel of John. Right here in, in Genesis, we see that God is a God of love. He wants to relate to us in a certain way. So right away here, we see that God is love. He's a relational God. He is love. And also, he doesn't just disappear on us. He is right with us. This will come, become significant when we go to the parables, the healing ministry of Jesus Christ. And as we come to the healing ministry, the miracles that we look at um, in a little bit, we want to understand these, three, these few things, that God is a relational God. People are important to him. People are important to him. Forget these other crazy things that go on that we see in a little bit. He's a relational God. He's a God of love. He is present with us. Whether we're suffering, whether we're happy, whatever, God is present with us, and that's what he tells us. And second, it, the fourth thing is that it says that the Sabbath is blessed. So blessing is part of the Sabbath. When God, and if, as we enter into the Sabbath, we are also blessed. God's presence his love, his blessing, was what marked the beginning of mankind. Can you imagine that? Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve began their journey through life, it was begun with the relationship with God, with the love of God, his presence, and his blessing. That's how mankind began. Mankind did not begin after a life of toil, and then they need to rest. They began with who God is, and the relationship that he wants to have with us. It's a very interesting perspective to recognize that. It was not an issue of toil that caused all of this, but it was an issue of, of who, who God is. So the primary purpose then of the Sabbath, from God's perspective, is that so our priorities can come in harmony with his priorities. 
That's the purpose of the Sabbath. Okay. Um, there's one other thing we want to go to before we go to the miracles, and that is chapter 1, verse 31. Then God saw everything that he had done, and indeed it was very good. Okay. What does that mean? First of all, I want to tell you, it seems to me that this is more packed with meaning than, we have, than we've given in the past. It said that God looked around and it was very good. What does very good mean? It was perfect. It was perfect, okay. That's important, right? Now think about chapter 3. As you think about that, think about chapter 3. Why is it important that it was very good or perfect? Why is that so important? Like evolution says that he used, you know, death to create life. Okay. He spoke and things were. So I think that's an argument against evolution. Okay. All right. So it's a good thing. It helps us with the evolution question. Okay. Very good. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm just about that something. So whatever God created was perfect. That's yes. the first thing. Yes. The second thing I realized that God Yes. And everything he created, he did it with a special purpose for it. So everything he did was good until he came later. Okay. It is important that whatever God made was perfect. In other words, Adam and Eve had no nothing in them that would have made them sin. He wasn't the author of that. They did that on their own, okay? So as I look at this idea of very good, very good means that God, whatever he did was absolutely perfect. There was nothing that Adam and Eve could say, you know something, there was a flaw, and that's the reason we, we sinned. It also prepares us for the idea that in that garden of bliss, there was also a serpent. And that's significant. There was also a serpent. And so when we look at Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we see that God's activity was perfect. But then... There came everything that followed after that. As a matter of fact, part of what happened after that related to people not uh, paying attention to the Sabbath. But, so the serpent was there. And then sin and suffering and disease came after that very good. So with that, I want to go to some of these miracles of Jesus. And what we want to keep in mind is that when God made the Sabbath, when he stopped his work, he began to enter into human existence. And that human existence, he's a relational God. He's an intimate God. He loves us. He is present with us, even in our suffering. And he wants to bless us. That's, that's God's heart towards us. And the Sabbath reminds us of that. When he said it was very good, it was very good. But there's also evil that exists. So the first um, thing we're going to... I'm actually going to look at this first parable in Luke chapter 6. The courtly gave it to us in Matthew chapter 12... But there's a little bit more detail in Luke chapter 6, and it's verses 6 to 11. So Luke chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. And, um, and I, I want to get to the one in chapter 13 as well, but, but let's just look at these miracles. So remember that God is a relational God. Jesus Christ is a relational God. When people are suffering, he's present with them. Now let's look at this. Now it happened on another Sabbath, also that he entered the synagogue and taught. And the man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him closely. So do you suppose this was the first Sabbath this man was in the synagogue? It probably was not. So they were probably watching this man. Sabbath after Sabbath, Sabbath this withered hand, right? And so, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he rose and stood. So here's this guy standing behind Jesus. And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking around at them all, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage. All right. So, why did Jesus Christ, yes, Scott? I think back to your original question on why you've got to rest on the Sabbath. I think of somebody who is an artist and they paint this beautiful masterpiece. When they're done, they step back and they 
they look at it. Yes. And they're like, that is very good. Yeah. Right? And they just enter into the painting and yeah. it. And they're enjoying what they have, quote, created. All right, now let's imagine he leaves the room and he comes back and something has marred the photo or, or marred the painting. Wouldn't the artist want to try to restore it, even if it's the Sabbath day? And so here Jesus walks into the synagogue and he sees something in his painting that wasn't quite right. He seeks to restore. Yes. And even though it was a Sabbath, he's trying to get it back to its original state, constant restoration. And so it shows that it's okay to do restorative things. I love that. I love your analogy. It is perfect. It is awesome. So God is the master artist. And, and the cool thing about him is that he, as, as artists will sit back and admire their work, he got involved with humanity at the very beginning in his work. It's just wonderful. God, I, just, I, just, I love the idea that God is a relational God. He's an intimate God. He's present with us. And he wants to be with us. And when something is wrong with that painting, as you say, he wants to restore it, even if it's the Sabbath day. Really important. God wants to restore it. Yes, go ahead. Okay, all right. And um, so, that, so it's really important, I think, that Jesus, Jesus, as he was in the synagogue, and the Pharisees, they were just looking for an excuse to, to get after him. Now, this is one story. The one that I want to get to, unless there was another, was there another hand up? Oh, sorry, go ahead. So um, I think what is important in this story, maybe another one, is where is the focus of your Sabbath day? Yes. Are you focused on not doing anything or avoiding doing something? Or like Jesus, are you focused on doing what is good? Okay. And I think that was the problem. The Jews and the leaders have understood that rest on the Sabbath day means don't do this, this, this. Okay. And Jesus was trying to, trying to change this perspective. Was telling them saying, do good on the Sabbath. Yes. Because if you are doing the good, and suddenly you are avoiding all the other stuff, but if you try to avoid the other the stuff by yourself, without being with God, you will, you will change the character of the Sabbath. And that is what is important that Jesus was saying us. The Sabbath, you have to do good. Only do good when you are with God. Okay, so he says, just to summarize, that the Sabbath is an opportunity for us to do what Jesus Christ did and to do good. I, I want to go to the next parable, but let me just cover Isaiah 58 really quickly as we're moving over to, to Luke chapter 13, an incredible story. Isaiah 58 is an important chapter in the Bible, and, and, and I wish we had more time to do that. So as we look at Jesus and what the Sabbath was intended to do, he asks us also to go and do likewise. So, the, so if you look at Isaiah 58, it has all these things. He says, is this a fast I proclaim that you do all these sacrifices and all these rituals, or is it? And he describes all these things where we serve humanity. And then at the very end, he adds in the Sabbath. And why does he put the Sabbath into that? Because the Sabbath, the whole idea of the Sabbath is to enter into the, his attitude, his heart towards people. And his heart towards people is one of restoration, it's one of relationship, it's one of concern, one of care, one of love. That's his idea. Whereas the scribes and the Pharisees, all they had the book up, check mark, check mark. That's all they had and wanted to see what you were doing bad. Okay, now this is a great story. And this adds something else to what we saw when the concept of very good we talked about. Whenever there's very good, there is a dissident voice. That dissident voice is the serpent in Genesis. So if we think about that, when God said this is very good, chapter 3 comes a serpent. And, and I'll tell you a story real quick that happened to me this week. So I was sitting in my office, a resident came to see me. And, he, and one, of our, one of my other residents, the mother is dying of pancreatic cancer. So this other resident came to my office and said, you know, it's not fair. 
that this lady is 60 years old and she's dying of pancreatic cancer. So I said, right, that's true, it's, it's not fair. And then he said, um, you know, because he, he's also a Christian. Then he said, you know, I can't stand it when people say, you know, God does everything for a reason. That's what he said to me, my res this, this resident. He's not a Seventh-day Adventist, he's a Christian. And I said, that's not true. And then I told him this story right here. So this is a great story. So we read the first one in, about the guy, guy with the withered hand. Um, and then now we see God going further and describing it. Jesus going further. So beginning at verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And the first thing I want to do is stop right there. Jesus Christ is so in tune with humanity. He's so aware of humanity that he's up there teaching and then he sees a woman who needs more than what he's speaking, right? So, so Jesus Christ is so attuned to the needs of humanity that he's in the synagogue teaching. However, he sees a lady come in the door. First lesson, there are times to drop what you're doing and pay attention to somebody else in need. Sometimes we get so focused on what we need to do that we ignore what's going on all around us. And the beauty of Jesus Christ, because he's an intimate God, he sees everything that's happening to us at all times. When we're suffering, he sees it. He never ignores. He never knows what's going on. So, and behold, there was a woman, verse 11, who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue. Now, we, I say to myself, am I, am I the ruler of the synagogue most of the time? I think I am. <laughs> so the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, this is the rule of the synagogue, said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. Well, the lady had already been there for 18 years probably, bent over, and, and they didn't do anything for her on the six other days. Verse 15, the Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead away to water it? So ought this so ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. So do you see the importance there? Do you see there where there is what Jesus wants, but there's this dissident voice, Satan, who is responsible for all the evil in the world that has gone on. And as we look at that, Jesus Christ wants to teach them a lesson in addition. And for us, as we speak to people, when the resident came to my office, I told him the story. That this evil has come as, as a result of Satan's doing. You know, this idea we give people that, that, that God there's, has a reason for everything. I'm like, wait a minute. This is something that Satan has done. Other, another time when Jesus was talking, he said, an enemy has done this. It's really important, that dissonant voice that he's speaking of, but the very good versus that dissonant voice, the voice of that serpent that's going to mess everything up that God intended. What a beautiful story, I think, that, uh, that happened here. Any other comments on this particular um, story, this miracle of Jesus? This is one of my favorite miracles in all of the Bible. Any comment on this, this miracle? Yes, I see two hands, John first and then Bob. about uh, healing people, but by the same token, uh, you know, do we do elective surgery on Sabbath yeah. just because it can be done on Sabbath? And I think one has to address that to decide not to be going too far in one direction. Uh, my friend Daryl uh, Ward just wrote a comment about people talking about doing good things on the Sabbath, yeah. and uh, he said, well, if they can do it like Jesus did it and speak it into existence, then I'm okay with that. Yeah. But if you're going out and painting somebody's house, that's a little different story. Yes. So I, maybe a comment. No, no, no. That, that's significant. 
and, and I want to talk about that a little bit. I'll make a comment. It's John, John's comment is, you know, uh, so as a physician, the physician, do you go do elective cases on the Sabbath? Do you use some, I know some, some churches, they, they may go clear the leaves on Sabbath from somebody's house, or they may help them paint their house because the house needs to be painted and so forth. Okay, Bob. God said, and then later it says, and God saw. So he says first, and then he saw the results of what he said. Yes. In this story that you just told, uh, he said, he said to the woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Yes. And when he said that, she was loosed yes. from her infirmity. It yes. reminds me of, uh, I think it's Psalms 110, Seven, it says that the, uh, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Yes. So it shows you the power of speech, and to a degree, we who are created in his image may not have that power, but we have the power of speech to say and then to, and then to see what we say. Yes, okay. All right, um, the bell rang. Uh, look, go ahead. I mean, you have two comments, and I just want to address something that John said and make a final comment. Go ahead. Okay. One thing is that Jesus made many miracles of healing people, but the healing on the Sabbath was, I think, the test was like almost always the sinner. Okay. Uh, let me. Let me. Just, I want to make sure everybody heard that. He said Jesus did many miracles. And some of them, about seven of them were on the Sabbath. They were always in the synagogue. All right, important point. Go ahead. Not going out looking for. Not going out looking, yes. Or recruiting. Yes. 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 Because we, we know that sometimes he go in the period and he can heal everyone. But yes. on the Sabbath, he was in the Sabbath teaching. Like yes. Yes. And he saw the situation coming. Yes. And then he resolved the situation. Okay. But I think don't, he did not have the project when waking up on the Sabbath. Ah, this day I'm going to go and heal. Yes. Preaching, teaching. Yes. And if the situation come along, when he's doing that, he do it. Okay. He didn't go out and been looking for stuff to do on the Sabbath day. Okay. Joe. Whatever the answer is to John's question, Isaiah 58 gives us a lot of good direction. Yes. But it closes with, "You will delight yourself in the Lord if yes. you do these things." Yes. Just yes. Like I want to spend some significant time in Isaiah 58. And obviously the bell is rung instead. Yes. Um, I do want to address the issue that John raised because we have struggled with this. There was the time, remember, when Jesus, um, it, the Bible says that after the sun had set, then the multitudes came to him and healed the multitudes after the sun had set. Every single time that Jesus Christ has healing ministries in the Bible, that I see the healing ministry of the Bible on the Sabbath, he was either on his way to the synagogue he was, or he was in the synagogue. He never went out and recruited work or anything like that. For the routine things, the sun set and then people came to him. He went and healed and he stayed up all night healing people. And I think that's a significant thing. Additionally, he did not need to have a huge armamentarium of people around to assist in his work. He did it all by himself, and he was an example to others. Um, I'm going to close with, I want us to go, go to Isaiah 58, and then I want us to make one statement, but Isaiah 58 is really important, and, I, and I, we cannot do it justice. But Isaiah 58, it describes, first of all, you know, all what the people are doing, all this ritual and everything that they're doing. And... Um, and then in verse 6 it says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke, is not to share your bread with the hungry, and that you bring, your, bring to your house the poor who are cast out. And when you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Um, and then it talks at the end about the Sabbath. There is a heart for humanity that Jesus Christ had. And that heart for humanity allowed him to recognize need in people wherever he went. 
That story about the lady that was loosed for, for, from her infirmities is a good example of Jesus always scanning the crowd, always recognizing where's the pain, where's the hurting person, what's the specific need, and he addresses it. The Sabbath reminds us that we were created in the image of God. It is a permanent institution. God drove the stake in time, but this is a permanent institution. Why? We are to remember that we are created in his image, relational beings, beings who are concerned more about other people than ourselves. That's what the Sabbath is all about. I just want to say this last statement that I, I wrote in my notes here. The seventh day tells us of the importance of human beings to God. And we need to have that same value of human beings to us as he has. It reminds us of the importance of human beings to God. And its primary message is not human duty, but divine commitment. That's really important. It's not so much about human duty, but about divine commitment. God is committed to mankind. Um, he stops all of his, his activity because he's found the object of his love. And, and we are so important to him. And he wants our fellow men to be just as important to us. We have heard so much crazy in the last several years. And God wants to fulfill in his people his heart towards his people, which is to reach out to others in love and selfless service. That's what it's all about. There are many questions that were raised, and over Sabbath lunch, we can discuss some of these questions, but uh, the Sabbath was made for the sake of man that we would really appreciate him and enter in relation with him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there's so much about the Sabbath that we don't understand, that we don't know, but your word is rich and informs us of the incredible love that you have for us, your desire to be in relationship with us. Our priority is to be in relationship with you as well. Father, forgive us where we've made the Sabbath a burden to other people, where we have made lists, where we have failed to recognize the need all around us. Father, I pray that you indeed speak to us and allow us to recognize that we are here for service. We are here to be the arms and feet of Jesus Christ. And what a wonderful day to be reminded of this on the Sabbath day. Thank you for loving us so much. For Jesus' sake, amen.